Tanner, Tanner, Tech, Tanner, Tech, Tanner. Hello, this is Tanner Tech. And today I'm going to be showing you something that I've been working on for quite a long time. And that's something called a theremin. Now I first heard of the theremin in 2016 when it came on a Google Doodle. I saw it and I knew immediately I had to have one. It was the coolest instrument. And so, you know, I looked at some videos, I looked at some schematics, but it was a bit too complicated for me at that time. So for around four years, I've been wanting to play a theremin. And finally this year, I figured I might as well build one. And so I gathered the vacuum tubes, I found a schematic to use, and I built one out of vacuum tubes. So this is what it sounds like. Now the theremin is a very unique instrument. Not only does it have a very unique sound, but it also has a way of playing it that's not shared by any other instrument. And that is the fact that you do not touch it while you play it. So on this side we have a volume antenna that changes the volume of the theremin. It gets louder the closer my hand is to it. And over here we have a pitch antenna that changes the pitch of the instrument the closer my hand is to it. And as you can see, it is very precise. It reacts to even the smallest of movements. So with that in mind, let's take a look at how this theremin works and some obstacles that I overcame while building this thing. Let's get started. So this is the theremin. As you can see, I built a pretty cool stand for it. Actually using some pieces from my old desk, like that base and the piece that the theremin is sitting on. So this is the top of the theremin. Here I have the volume control antenna. Then I have the volume tuner, which is a tuning capacitor in parallel with the volume antenna and ground. Over here I have the second antenna. This is the pitch antenna and the pitch tuning capacitor. Over here is the power supply section. I have the 6x4 rectifier tube and two OA2 gas filled regulator tubes. They're both in series and both of them provides 150 volts of regulation. Together that's 300 volts. Over here we have the power supply transformer. This is Acme brand, kind of funny, and it's actually from 1946. This is the power switch, and then here is the heart of the theremin. We have two 6BE6 tubes that consist of the pitch oscillator. Then we have the 6AN8 tube, which is the volume oscillator which puts out a voltage based off how close your hand is to this antenna. And we have the 12AU7 in the back, that's the mixer tube, which mixes the incoming signals from both of these antennas into the final output audio signal. It comes out this 3.5 millimeter headphone jack behind here. So I built this whole theremin so that way it can easily be detached from its stand. There's just a couple of velcro strips holding it on and so you can easily remove the theremin to either transport it or repair it on the inside. This is the underside of the theremin. Here we have the line filter, filters the electricity coming in. That goes through a power switch then into the mains transformer. That then goes into the power supply board. That power supply board creates 300 volts of filtered DC current sends it to various points of the actual heart of the circuit. This is the board that has the pitch oscillator on this side, the volume oscillator here, and the mixer here. Now if you want to hear a detailed explanation about how this circuit works, stay tuned till the end of the video. It's about seven minutes long, but it's very interesting. My process in building the theremin wasn't easy. There were lots of challenges along the way. So let's take a look at some of those. Some of my challenges were pretty funny. And some of them just ended up with the theremin sounding horrible. And the first test.
All right, first start up. We already had the magic smoke. Dang it. It is 12.30, and this theremin has become an AM radio. So if you listen to it right now, it sounds horrible. It sounds very bad. And I was struggling with this problem a lot. And I finally was able to solve the problem somewhat by taking it into another room and plugging it into another outlet. Now, I at that moment thought that the reason that it was working there and not here was because there was less electromagnetic interference in this room. but. I finally figured out the real reason why, and that was because it wasn't properly grounded. You see, the outlets in my room may be grounded correctly for safety, but they're not grounded correctly for RF. When something is grounded correctly for RF, you have a metal rod, you put it into the ground, and you have a wire that connects from that metal rod to whatever device you're using. And so, here I have a wire that goes outside to a metal rod hammered in the ground. Now, remember, this is what it sounded like before. Now when I connect the ground... Well, that is the theremin. It sounds great, and actually today I just found some new knobs for the tuning capacitors. That makes it so much easier to tune. I was at this like swap meet thing, and I found an old vacuum tube voltmeter that was really trashed, but it had good knobs on it, and the knobs fit my tuning capacitors. So let's hear what the theremin sounds like for a little bit. I'll show you a couple clips of me playing it. Of course, I'm not the best at it yet. I am hoping to learn it better. And then, following that, you can hear my seven minute long explanation about how the circuit works. What's very interesting is that if I play this in a room that has a small amount of electromagnetic interference, it kind of changes the tone to sound something like a trumpet, because you've got those 60 hertz harmonics in there, which sounds pretty good for a song like God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, a classic Christmas song. This is the circuit for my theremin. This actually comes from a 1961 electronics magazine. So first of all, we have the AC voltage. It comes into the primary coil of the mains transformer. Now one of my modifications was adding an AC line filter between here and here. We also have a switch that goes to the primary coil. Now we have two secondary coils on this transformer. The first secondary coil supplies the filament circuit which is basically all the filaments of the vacuum tubes in parallel. This is at 6.3 volts. 
The second half of the secondary coil of the transformer is the high voltage side. Actually, the voltage between this point and this point is approximately 600 volts. When we add a 6x4 rectifier vacuum tube here, and we set the center tap of this coil to ground, it effectively makes a full wave rectifier. So we get a full wave rectified DC signal at this point. That is then cleaned up by these three large electrolytic capacitors and these two resistors. The first voltage output, A, goes to the 12AU7 section of the circuit. It then goes through three resistors and three capacitors to these reference points on the board, which go to the three separate oscillator circuits. Now the reason that this exists is to prevent one of these oscillator circuits from leaking frequency to another one, which could cause interference. If point D had some frequency on it, that frequency would be canceled out by this C23. It effectively cleans up and makes these oscillators so they don't interfere with each other. And it provides a cleaner DC voltage. Now going to the main section of the circuit, we can break it up into really four main blocks. The variable pitch oscillator, the fixed pitch oscillator, and the variable volume oscillator, and the mixer circuit. So let's start with the variable pitch oscillator. We have a 6BE6 tube, which is known as a heptode vacuum tube, because it has two control grids, two screen grids, and one suppressor grid. The control grids control the amount of electrons that flow through. The screen grids accelerate the electrons to make the vacuum tube have a higher gain. And the deflector grid at the top deflects any electrons that happen to just fly off the plate when it is struck by electrons back into the plate, making the tube more efficient and reducing parasitic oscillations. Now here we have a coil and a capacitor. This forms something called an LC tank circuit, which is resonant at a certain frequency. This entire oscillator, and in fact the oscillator of each of the circuits, is something called a Hartley oscillator. Now what happens is when I move my hand closer to this tone antenna, the circuit oscillates at a different pitch, because when I move my hand closer it changes the capacitance of this capacitor, which changes its fundamental frequency. And so by moving my hand we can vary the frequency output on this line here. This frequency output is then fed into the second control grid of the second 6B6 vacuum tube. Now, imagine that this circuit is oscillating at around 450 kilohertz, and this circuit is oscillating at 450 kilohertz, the exact same. Now what's going to happen is this frequency, because it's fed into this second control grid, this tube is going to act as a mixer, and it's going to spit out the sum and the difference of the two frequencies, the frequency of this oscillator and this oscillator. Now, it also spits out some other harmonics, but the two major frequencies are the sum and the difference. Now, the sum of that is 900 kilohertz, which is too big for us to work with. And so that's going to be filtered away through this capacitor 9 to ground. It's going to effectively get rid of that signal. Now, that lower frequency, 450 kilohertz minus 450 kilohertz, is in fact 0 hertz. And so that second frequency is going to be nothing. So on this output, we're going to get a frequency of zero. Now imagine that this tube, we move our hand closer to it, and this is instead of oscillating at 450.44 kilohertz. And this one is still oscillating at 450 kilohertz exactly. Now something interesting is going to happen. The sum of that is obviously too big and is going to be filtered away, but the difference is 440 hertz. Now, if you're familiar with music theory, 440 hertz is in fact the note of A. So we're going to have that 440 hertz frequency, which is A, and it's going to be present on R7, which is the volume control resistor. So we can see that by moving our hand closer to and farther from the tone antenna, we can actually control the output frequency here in a range that is audible to us. Now comes the volume control part of the circuit. We see that it's very similar. It uses a different vacuum tube, a 6A and 8, but this is effectively a pentode. You have the control grid, screen grid, 
suppressor grid. Similar to the 6B6, except we're missing the second screen and control grids. We also have the same kind of setup here with an RF coil, a capacitor, and a volume control antenna that changes the frequency of the circuit as we move our hand closer to it. Now here's where the interesting part comes in. We have a crystal here. This crystal, in my case, is set at 500 kilohertz. And so what happens is, if this tube is oscillating at exactly 500 kilohertz, 100% of that signal, or close to that, is going to make it to the crystal, because that's at the resonant frequency of the crystal. That's then going to be amplified by the 6A and 8 second half of the tube. The 6A and 8 actually has two halves in one, two tubes in one. And that output voltage is going to be rectified by this diode, and so we're going to get a negative voltage on here, that is going to come and is going to be present on both of these grids through our resistor. That's going to create something called a negative bias. So if we have a signal here, and it's a signal that would normally be amplified, and if we had a negative bias on that grid where the signal is supposed to be amplified at, well, we're going to get a whole lot of nothing because negatively biasing each grid effectively shuts off the tube. Now, Let's say I move my hand closer to the volume control antenna. That's going to raise the frequency a little bit, or lower the frequency. Now when that happens, less of that signal is going to get to the crystal because it's no longer oscillating at the fundamental frequency of it. Which means that this tube is going to be amplifying less and less of a signal. Which means the voltage at this point is going to be greater and greater. And by greater and greater, I mean closer to zero which means that these grids are no longer going to be negatively biased, which means that the output voltage on here, the output frequency, is going to be effectively amplified and sent out on the output jack. It's going to go to my amplifier. So there you go. I wasn't exactly truthful. That was about an eight minute explanation of the circuit, but I hope you found that interesting. I really had a lot of fun learning about how this circuit works. It's fascinating. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and perhaps learned something. There are going to be more videos down the line about this theremin. I'm going to be looking at ways to improve it, to change the output sound to just sound a little bit different, and maybe make it work better in high electromagnetic noise environments. So, see you next time.